to, to speak today. Well, I will be focusing on uh, families, energy, and climate change. And I will switch over here so you can see me better while I'll begin to work on the topics. And what we have here is uh, three dimensions that I think are very important. The first one is that households are the main consumers of, uh, one of the main consumers of energy in our economies. So houses, buildings, transport to school, all those things require energy. And uh, it's also direct and indirect emissions because by purchasing things, eventually you're purchasing the energy needed to move them. The second point is that energy savings, all that can be brought by new technologies or new practices, um, would help or can help in, uh, improve the budget of the families. They would spend less on energy, they would save more and be more productive. And that, in aggregate, helps the entire economy and uh, reduces the global footprint of households or families. And it's very important to take into account that they are different to firms. Firms have access to credit more readily, have specialized people dealing with energy and savings, and households, they are, well, just like us, practicing getting things together, agreeing and moving forward. Now, the fourth point is that families can contribute to reduce climate uh, change, to reduce emissions, but they also will be suffering the impact of whatever climate change is not stopped. Whatever is left, the effects of being below two degrees centigrade of, of global warming or going beyond that, these families will have an impact and we will uh, look at best practices regarding that. So my next slide, it's about uh, three papers that we have in, at uh, WRI. This paper is by a team in India that went over and decided to ask, what does it take for a um, family to install solar panels? And to install solar panels in India, where you have an unequal distribution of income and you have lower incomes on average, what does it take for a family to install rooftop panels? And India is very ambitious. The goal of achieving 20 gigawatts of installed rooftop solar is in the horizon. And in 2018, they have 1.2 uh, gigawatts. Now in 2022, this has risen to 7.6. So they're on their, on their way there. But uh, the movement was very slow. So this team went in and uh, began to ask people, why did you install solar panels? Why not? What is the barrier? Why are you reluctant to do so? And uh, the argument was that in this case, if you're just connecting to the grid, just to the line, a power, uh, a power plant connected to the city, it's just, you just have to hoop up and the household is in. But with a rooftop panel, you need to have participation. You need household to say, yes, I will buy it. Yes, I will install it. Yes, I will uh, give it maintenance. They have to be active participants. And the government of India launched a very large subsidy program. Their utilities, their electricity generation is uh, in a dire strait. So having a new, the new installed capacity being in the roof of the people's houses was a very attractive proposition. So you have there, and you had a very slow movement at the beginning. And then and the team went in and began to ask directly. They asked one, uh, nearly 2,000 households, 2,000 families in 2018. And what they found out, this is, uh, by the way, you can reach it, is by Devi, my, my colleagues, uh, Mala Devi, Uttara Narayan, and Tirkandal Mandal. And uh, they asked people, why did you install? And uh, the main barriers, the three takeaways, were that there was a problem of information. When people were asked, do you know about solar panels? Do you know what could be generated with this? People said, I really don't know. And one of the main reasons for not installing was that people didn't know. They got the information from vendors, from government sites, but the people they trust to give them real information are their own families, their neighbors, the people that have installed previously and say, yes, this works. And information was flowing through the commercial and government sites and not through the social network that people used to take into account. The second one was that financing was complicated. 
In some places, the tariff structure was electricity from the grid was subsidized. Well, it wasn't worth it. Just like in Mexico, if you are paying less than, let's say, 5,000 pesos per bimester um, of electricity, then you won't have a solar panel that is profitable in the long term. You basically are being subsidized in your electricity consumption, and you're better off connected to the grid as a family, as a household, but not as a country, because uh, solar energy is cheaper than most of the fossil fuel generation now. So the other problem was, and for some families, the tariff structure didn't make it profitable to install. And for, for others, the collateral, the kind of things you have to put in to get a loan to install the panels was too high, something they were not accustomed. If they were used to buy refrigerators or air conditionings, this was way off what a normal family would be experiencing. So information, financing was the second problem. And then the third one was institutions. And a good way to illustrate it is our team found in Chennai that the utility, the uh, national, well, the electricity commission delivering to the houses said, no, no, if you install solar panels, then I won't be selling electricity and I would be at fault. So they were opposed interest from, uh, from a, a government firm selling electricity or a utility. In other places in Chandangrian, the architecture regulation was a problem. The rooftops could not be altered or could not be intervened with solar panels. And I don't mean that if you have historical building, you have to put ugly solar panels on top and then, but we have been seeing this movement about integrating solar panels into our, the architecture. Now we have Vatican City moving into its historical buildings with solar panels that blend in with the architecture, that respect the architecture and still generate and respect Mother Earth at the same time. Now, uh, in general, as many middle and lower income countries, there was bureaucracy and officials with not enough information. Those three things were the main causes. And look at the results. The, um, uh, what we have is um, the reasons. All the areas in blue and in red are the areas that did not have information enough to decide. So you have between 40 and 70 percent almost of the households not deciding to put panels because they didn't have the information. And this is 2018. So an effort to provide information through the networks that people trust is one of the lessons there. The second one is that the economics, the area in purple, it's around 20 percentage points. 20 percent of the people that were not installing solar panels said, you know, it doesn't make economic sense for me in particular. Maybe the collateral was too high, the finance terms or the subsidy didn't make sense. And well, one question for you when I finish, um, I'm going to be asking my real world audience here and also the virtual audience is if you look at this, all the reasons you have there, physical constraints, have heard bad reviews, no value for money, uh, other, what other reasons would you act upon? How would you transform India's uh, solar rooftop program to make it better? So please take a look at this one. It's going to be an exam for the people at the Universidad Panamericana, uh, but we'll go and what ideas do you have? Okay, so next one is the reason. Now let's look at the economics. Information, economics, here is the economic story. You have all the five cities where we studied this uh, problem and in the, area, the line in purple is the price, the cost of electricity per kilowatt hour. So you see certain cities, Chandagran has a lower price and you have a Nagpur with a higher price. And you see the number of years needed to recover the investment. So the first point is you recover the investment. That's the cool thing first about solar panels. You obtain whatever you invest, you obtain a return and then some more. And that means it is valuable for the household and it's valuable for the country and it's valuable for the planet. But even so, look, in uh, some places you recover this after eight years, 16 years, 10 years, and the higher the price, the faster you recover investment and it's logical. If it's more expensive with electricity, you are saving with a solar panel more, more expensive electricity. So between six and eight years. And look at the subsidies, the subsidies that already the Indian government devoted to support solar panels, you see how it shaves off one year. So instead of recovering it in, 
eight years, you recover it in seven or in six. You obtain a faster return on investment just thanks to the subsidy. And that would help many families take the step forward for their own budget to save energy and uh, to uh, save energy for the entire grid of their state or their city and contribute to reduce climate change. So remember, families are very important consumers and families here are making a difference by installing new, new technologies. Now, this is a second case. We'll be moving from India to the US. And here, it's a team by Greg Carlock, Gillian Newberg, Leslie Calle, and Evana Said. And uh, my four colleagues begin to look at the way electricity, energy in the US was being consumed by households. So let's look at how different is this. In their case, they begin to take national statistics and uh, looked at how much did people spend from their own budget. Remember, we, uh, the first argument was you save energy, you save emissions, and you help planet and, and, and the national economy. Well, what percentage of your electricity bill means, what does your electricity bill mean with respect to your overall income? So again, for people at the Universidad Panamericana, I will ask the, to you calculate this number. How much do you spend on electricity each month? And what does it mean from your family's income every month? So get that percentage. And especially you professors are going to be the ones I will be asking first. Uh, here, uh, the definition of a high energy burden is when you spend more than 6% of your income, your monthly income on energy, on electricity and fuel. And if you spend more than 10% of your income, you're uh, classified as having a severe energy burden. So this team of you know, fantastic researchers went in and began to look at, well, the average 25% uh, of households in the entire US spends more than 6% of their income in, electric in electricity, natural gas, and heating bills, in the energy needed for their household. Now, if we look at black households, this number increased to 36%. That means more than one third of black households have a high energy burden. We go into Native American and Hispanic, and here we have also 36 and 28%. That means that the energy burden is higher among people of color, among families of color. And uh, this is compared to the white uh, population in the US. Now, regarding the housing, the people that rent, 30% of them have a high energy burden. And the people that own houses, this is around 22%. And among families with low income, almost two thirds of them spend, it, are facing a high energy burden. So you have the US, different from India, in a place with overall greater prosperity, but still having the lower income families and the people of color having higher energy burdens. What do we do with that? So this team went in and began to map how did it look. Here you have a map of the US, and each one of them is one county. And you look at the energy burden over there in the graph. The darker the color means that the burden is higher. The share of people have with an with a energy burden, the average burden is higher. And also you have the racial distribution. Why are people of color, why are blacks, Hispanics, uh, Native Americans facing higher uh, uh, energy burden is still not known. It might be because they are renting houses and they have little to say in what is invested in the house. The house might be losing energy because it has just not weatherized. It has very, um, uh, very little defenses against the external environment, but it, it's not invested in, in, in enough of that. Is there racism in the world, uh, sidelining, access to programs? The many, there's a confluence of factors, but this is the picture. This is the current reality. The weight is heavier on different households, depending on their status, income, housing. And um, well, what is the government of the US doing around it? And there are three things uh, that the programs that the team studied. The first one is the weatherization of homes, the way you make your house better to withstand cold temperatures if you are in the north 
or hot temperatures if, if you're in the south. And also helping with energy efficiency. These investments that we mentioned that they were lacking, helping, subsidizing, uh, providing loans, guarantees, etc., to invest in those uh, things that would save energy for the household and for the economy and reduce uh, overall emissions. And then the same thing as in India, installing solar panels, tax credits, and subsidies to get there. In this case, grids are working, every, almost everyone is connected, but the idea is to begin to make the switch. So look at the parallels. Families in very different geographies, in very different places, having, facing similar uh, challenges. And uh, what uh, we have, programs like this, the weatherization assistance programs, the non-business energy property tax credit, single family housing repair loans and grants programs. There are many different programs with names that need to be accessed to help people to get their families to get there. There are two great targeting and outreach tools ways in which you can get in and find out where are those communities, like in the map we just showed. And one of them is the environmental justice screening and mapping tool. It looks at um, access to resources and where is the greatest need, and they can, you can pin the, pinpoint them out. And the Department of Energy also has an energy justice dashboard. These are tools to find out where are people, if you have a limited amount of subsidies, where do you put it? to make the greatest impact in terms of equity and in terms of environmental issues, environmental improvements. Now, with the current uh, administration, the Inflation, Inflation Reduction Act, you will have these same programs and more boosted to, uh, to get to more families and begin to save energy, budget, and... Uh, now, Let's take five more minutes to look at the other side of climate change. We see families in India and the US able to contribute to reduce climate change impact. And it's a good way to channel because it's real decisions, hard decisions, because if you invest in something, uh, energy efficiency, weatherization, or solar panels, that means you're devoting budget to that and not to other things. The real balance, the day-to-day -day balance needs to be achieved to get families moving. But well, what about climate resilience? We know that um, there are things that nature can help us to deal with climate change. And one of them is watersheds. If you protect watersheds, you are protecting the water that reaches the families, the communities. Uh, if you increase tree cover and green space in cities, then you can provide more shade and reduce the impact of heat islands. So the impact of heat the impact of having less water and the impact of storms, protecting mangroves and reefs can reduce coastal flood risk against the three impacts, heat, lack of water, and in catastrophic risky events, you can have nature help you there. But you need to invest in nature, you need to protect nature to help protect the communities. Well, nature-based solutions also have families in their midst. And uh, in Mexico, the WRI is collaborating with three projects I like. Now, there are still not publications like the other two, uh, which you can reach in our website, but they will be future publications because we're working with, we're finding what works, what doesn't, what drives families to participate, and what drives families to be there uh, for their community. And, um, and remember, even if it's today's climate, the current climate causing the storm, or the first signals of the new climate, a more harsher environment, environmental, more a climate with that changed. The current climate or the future climate making its first appearances, there is risk. There's uh, natural disasters that we need to get involved and support families, communities, uh, and the local governments there. The three things and the three exciting projects that I, uh, I recommend you to follow up as we advance this year and next year, our first restoring uh, mangroves in the Yucatan Peninsula. Here, it's working with communities where mangroves were lost to, um, I don't know, illegal def uh, deforestation, to um, expansion of urban areas. Losing mangroves meant losing the protection from storms. So in the Yucatan Peninsula, participation with communities, families joining their restoration program, getting skills in that is one of those projects that's being launched. The second one 
is in Sintalapa, in Chiapas, where landslides after big storms caused uh, families to lose uh, what little they had. The investment in their land, land got eroded, uh, houses were uh, broken down. So how do we improve resilience to storms? Here, WRI is working also with partners to generate, to uh, plan to be prepared for disasters. And it, being prepared makes a difference between losing your assets, losing health, losing lives, and just receiving the impact, but being resilient to the impact. And there, one of the ideas is an early alert system, land restoration and land zoning, saying this is an area of too much risk, should be devoted to nature, let nature occupy space, and people move their dwellings and their economic activities elsewhere. Or restore land, regrow uh, re forests there. And having an alert system means a way in which the signal storm is coming, landslides might happen here, here, and there, and then you begin to get families helping other families being resilient, move away, move fast, find refuge there. So these three things are there. Are, uh, the maps are being generated, where are those areas, but then you would need the investment and the action. And the third one is working with Monterrey and Aucalpan, in precisely in cities that grew too fast and forgot about their trees, to get more trees there to avoid uh, impacts of heat. Heat uh, that can be, especially like the weeks we have experienced recently, that can be damaging to health, children going to school, families enjoying outdoor activities, or just being inside. This idea of having a shaded city, city with more forests, forests can help protect them. So, uh, and it's open to other cities. Three good ideas, three good practices that can work, and we'll keep you posted on as we begin to find out, like in the case of India, and like in the case in the US, what are the patterns? Who participates, who doesn't? What community gets in forward? What makes this work? And this is where we call upon you. We need to find out what works to make it work more. With this, I will finish and be open to your questions. Thank you.